It's possible that many of you have had some difficulties in the recent months transitioning from a traditional face-to-face -face course to a fully online course, uh, especially if it was mid-semester. This video is meant to provide some alternatives, not only for when we're transitioning to a, a remote setting, but also for any sort of um, setup for a course. It could be face-to-face, -face, online, hybrid, it doesn't really matter. You have a lot of options that you can create for yourself as well as for your students. So primarily, when you look at how you are going to build a course, I know most of us think about our course objectives, and then we kind of backpedal from there. So what are we hoping to achieve with the course? And then based on that, how do we reach those objectives? So this uh, document that you have, as well as this video, is going to quickly go over some options that I've used in the past, as well as options that have come to light via research, as well as some of the experiences that others have had based on uh, remote instruction or a fully online course creation. So this is purely a resource. You can use all of it or none of it. It's totally your call. I'm gonna cover a couple of different ways that you can provide alternative instruction for yourself and for your students. Looking at presentations, options, exams and quizzes, group projects, and some of the more logistical issues such as office hours, conferences, or face-to-face -face meetings. And there are links embedded in this document, um, obviously not in the video, but when you open the document, the PDF file should give you direct links to each of the um, required resources or the available resources. So this first one is all about the designation of options for your students. So a lot of times we say you must achieve these goals and you must do it in this way. And in a lot of cases, that's absolutely correct. In, for example, a public speaking class, you are certainly going to <laughs> require speeches. That's uh, a necessity for the purpose of the class. So in many cases, what you are requiring doesn't really fit the desire for um, giving students alternative options or choice. When creating a final project, that may be a little bit different. And so the question you wanna ask yourself is, what's your goal with the assignment? Is it mastery of content? or is it something a little bit more um, specific to the logistics of how they deliver it? If you're doing a writing uh, assignment, is the idea of the information being expressed in writing the most important thing, or is there a different aspect that you're approaching, a different perspective? So when you want to offer options, consider some of the different desires or goals that you want to achieve. So for example, in my own classes, there's a culminating assignment in a lot of cases. And that culminating assignment at the end of a unit or the end of a course, the goal is to show me your mastery of the content and the information as opposed to the skill set of writing or delivering a speech or whatever it might be. So it just depends on the course that you have and your objectives and how you hope to meet those objectives. So one example is my interpersonal communication course where students are asked at the end of the course to create a final project. Now that course is all about content and connecting content to experiences, whether they be past, present, or future, and how they handle or manage that content in connection to those experiences. So my goal there isn't necessarily to see how well they deliver a speech or write a paper, but more their connections to of the content to those experiences. So in that case, I give them some options. And in my certain my specific situation, I provide them three options to display or demonstrate their mastery of the content. And in this document that you have, you will have a direct link to those examples. I provide three options, as I said. One is more of like a portfolio, a demonstration in um, sort of a presentation mode. The other is to create a website with that content. And then the third one is a formal presentation that they do using voiceover on a PowerPoint. So there's a lot of options that I address here. And I've given you a link. It'll take you directly to the end of the document where Appendix C is, and you can see um, exactly the details that I use for those assignments. 
So your question is, how do I even offer those options? There are a lot of different ways that you can consider using options in a course. So for example, I gave you mine for my interpersonal course, but you may be teaching a course in um, algebra. And you think, okay, well, how in the world would I offer options? The student is going to show and demonstrate that they can create or complete a problem or not. But that isn't the case. You can provide them a different mode of demonstrating that knowledge, whether that be to use a pin cast capture. Um, and there's a couple of different uh, uh, training tools that can show you how to make use of things like pin cast. They can also do a screen capture similar to what I'm doing here. They can do a formal presentation in front of an audience. They can create a learning tool for students or younger kids, uh, kind of like Khan Academy. They could create a video that shows and demonstrates their mastery and teaches others how to do it. They could write a paper that explains some of the information and then demonstrates their understanding of the concept. There's really a lot of options. Um, so think about what your goal is and if that goal isn't that they do it in a certain way and more that they demonstrate understanding of the concept, that's how you want to approach the idea of offering options. So that's the biggest thing I wanted to bring out here. I have given a couple of ways in which if you are doing an online class or a hybrid or something that is heavily um, connected to virtual tools of any kind, how you can go about doing things in a more digital manner. So for example, if you want to deliver presentations digitally, any kind of presentation, whether that's public speaking, group presentations, if it's a, a portion of a demonstration, something along those lines, there's a lot of options. So you can use YouTube. Obviously, it's a little bit easier for students to upload their assignment in Blackboard if they have just a link to upload as opposed to uploading a full video, which can take a lot of space and can be very frustrating for both faculty and students because sometimes bandwidth or uh, your internet speed or whatever it might be could cause issues there. So I've given some links to how to create a YouTube account and how to create and upload YouTube videos if you or your students choose to do that. And feel free to share those links to all of your classes if you would like for your students to have that information. Also, when you are uh, creating YouTube videos, it's important to make sure the students know to put something as public or unlisted as opposed to private, because that private means that only the person that created the video can see it. Another option that I use actually in my public speaking classes quite a bit is to have students deliver those presentations via Zoom. And when I use something along those lines, I do have a sign up sheet and I try to restrict it to a smaller amount of presentations so that when we get on Microsoft Teams or Zoom, we don't have 25 students delivering presentations at the same time. So I designate certain time periods for that, but you can do it any way you wish. There is a link here that allows you to um, sort of look at how using Zoom is valuable when recording presentations. Um, the students can do it themselves or they can meet with you and other students to deliver the presentations. It's actually quite simple. Zoom, Microsoft Teams, however you choose to do it, it's a pretty easy process. Another option is OneDrive or any other cloud-based service. I know that the SWIC student email comes with OneDrive, but it depends on what you personally use. For example, I use Dropbox, but a lot of, a lot of students use Google Drive um, or iCloud Drive. A lot of students use Google Drive. That seems to be the primary mode, but just depends on what you're using. But they can share files that way as well. So if you're, again, worried about the depth um, of time, that is connected to students having to upload videos of any sort, then they can share those documents via Dropbox or OneDrive or Google Drive or whatever it might be. So that's a way to do presentations. If you, especially if you require an audience of any sort, um, the Zoom slash Microsoft Team option is one of the better options. Then we have a discussion of exams and quizzes. So if you normally give paper exams or quizzes, there are alternatives. The best alternative I have found is essay or short answer questions, if that's possible. 
if you try to use too many of the uh, multiple choice or fill in the blank or whatever, true, false, whatever that might be, you run a higher risk of dealing with um, cheating and plagiarism and all of that, So, or cheating in general. So it's one thing to kind of consider using essay responses in order, especially personalized essay responses, in order to allow your students to avoid <laughs> or encourage your students to avoid any kind of negative behavior in that area. Another option is open book, open note exams, which might sound counterintuitive, but uh, research has shown that allowing students a lot of time and the ability to kind of look through some of the information and see what it is that they are, um, how they're analyzing a question and how they are approaching their responses, that can be a really good option for students, especially if you want to do that as a sort of a pretest and then provide a post test that is a little bit more in depth, that's an option as well. I actually find this to work really, really well for my students. And what we do typically is to have the questions be very application based, not a lot of the definition is this or which one of these meets this definition or what have you. And we all know that, but I do find that it works really well for my students and for myself as well. It takes a little extra time to grade, but it tends to work out pretty well. Another section is group projects or presentations. I know many of us have those in our classes. So again, you can use Zoom recordings or Microsoft Team recordings to have the students deliver their presentations. You can also replace the group assignment with a more individualized one if you feel like that is too complicated or if students tend to struggle quite a bit. And I've provided examples. Now again, these are from Communication Arts Department but please feel free to share with me some of the examples that you do in your classes. Um, and I'd love to have them from all over the board, from business to health and homeland security to all kinds of different categories of information. I would love to see how you approach various assignments. And especially if you're willing to share those with the rest of the faculty, that would be fantastic. But you can replace them with that sort of material. So, and I've given you again, links directly to those. And then finally, we have our more logistical um, issues that people have ended up needing to make alternatives for. And one of those is your office hours, or if you do conferences, I know a lot of English instructors, professors do conferences. I know that a lot of the communication arts professors do conferences. So it tends to be uh, difficult when you're fully online to approach that in the same way that you would in a face-to-face -face circumstance. So one option is to do phone conferences or phone uh, resources or office hours or whatever it might be. And if you're uncomfortable with your phone number being given out, obviously we can have phone numbers forwarded. But if you don't have a direct line from SWIC to uh, an office, you can also create a Google Voice number or other resources that are similar. This is just the one that I've used before. And I've provided a link here that'll take you to how to use and set up a Google Voice number. And it is free. As long as you have a Gmail account, you should be able to use it without any issues. Or again, you can have your phone number if you have a direct line. You can have that transferred to your cell number. So students are not getting your actual number. They're contacting your office and that's being forwarded to you. I will note that depending upon your service, uh, for example, I have my phone, my phone number in my office transferred to my cell, but because of the service that I use, T-Mobile, a lot of times those calls that come into me will read scam likely as opposed to a phone number directly. I mean, I typically can tell where it's coming from because it'll come from a student that is in the local area, but for the most part, it says scam likely. Um, and I just have to realize that in this particular case, during these time periods, those are not likely scams. They're probably my students getting forwarded from my office number. So again, you can also do office hours and conferences in that way. You can obviously always use email, the phone, like I told you. You can set up a Zoom or Microsoft Teams meeting. So you can have your office hours weekly where you're just on just like you would be physically sitting in your office, you are physically sitting in the Zoom room or the Microsoft Teams room 
and students have a link where they can just jump on and, and have a conversation with you. I know a lot of our faculty have been using that in the last few weeks. Another thing I would highly recommend, especially if you do conferences, is to create a self-sufficient sign-up sheet using a tool like Sign Up Genius or something similar. And I have given a link to how to use Sign Up Genius because a lot of times, especially if I do conferences that are set up during a certain time period, I will have students wait till the last minute to sign up or they will sign up and need to change and I don't have the mental capacity to try and coordinate all of that. So I just use Sign Up Genius. And then what I typically do to avoid last minute changes is the morning of a conference, I will go in and I will select any open spots and mark them not available. I'll just change my name from Kristen Rupert Leach to not available. And that allows me to know exactly who has signed up for that specific day. Now that may not be something you wanna do if it's just office hours but a scheduled formal conference or something along those lines, then you can be a little bit more restrictive in that manner. Another option or another category is group meetings. So you can also meet with your, your groups, your group of students or with your faculty or your, your coworkers of any group. You can meet with them using Zoom or Teams. You can also hold live class in the same kind of way. So if you wanna set up a date and time each week, that you hold a live lecture, as long as you record it, that is always a fantastic option. The ability to record using Zoom or Teams is very simple. You just set it up so that it automatically records or you click the button to record and you can have your normal class like you would typically do, whiteboard and everything. The only thing I would highly recommend is not to make that a requirement to attend live. Actually, I would, in my personal experience, uh, I have been successful in offering a little bit of extra credit for students to attend live. I provide them the extra credit for the actual live attendance, but I also record and provide the recording and require students to provide me either a passcode or an answer to a question or a summary of the lecture, whatever it might be, in order to verify that they have watched or uh, participated in that lecture. So just my only advice though for sure is not to require live attendance because students, especially if they signed up for a fully online class, they don't typically have the exact schedule that you're gonna need for them to attend live. So offering a little extra credit to attend live, but then also making it a requirement for them to watch that recording and then do whatever it is needed that they, can, they need to do in order to present their knowledge that they have watched the lecture, that's probably the best option. And that's pretty much it. Uh, after this in the document has all those appendices that I was telling you about with all the examples that we have, including some of the rubrics, and there is additional information if you choose to ch sort of check it out. Hopefully this is helpful, and if you have questions, you can always reach out to me at Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-E-N, dot Rupert hyphen Leach, um, and I won't spell that out for you. You can uh, see it in my email when it's, this video gets sent out, but please feel free to reach out to me at any time with your ideas or uh, questions, and I'm happy to answer them. Thanks so much, guys. Good luck.